Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Tessia and these are beauty lessons, what God is speaking, teaching, and revealing to me. So I'm gonna continue talking about suffering and discouragement and hopelessness and kind of this journey that God's taking me on in really having my hope rooted in him, anchored in him, and um, what he's showing me and revealing me in the midst of this, uh, this kind of season or this trial. So I shared last week, and many of you know, that I have struggled with discouragement, bouts of discouragement, and um, I reached a place where I said, God, I can't go through this anymore. I can't live um, so discouraged and hopeless. And so last week, as some of you know, uh, we had our ministry banquet. We shared um, about what God's doing in evangelism ministry and um, all the different things that we do. And we had, you know, a big dinner and a speaker named Bruce Marciano came. He is um, a producer, actor, director. He's in the film industry, but he also is a great man of God and a missionary um, or was, you know, a missionary at times, but he's in ministry. So he came and he spoke at our banquet and something that God had been speaking to me, um, but kind of was emphasized through him was stop using human metrics. So stop measuring kingdom things, things that you do for God, things that um, you think are just what you're supposed to do or what's expected of you instead of, um, you know, actually what you do for the Lord. Stop measuring those things by human standards or human systems of measurement, human metrics. Measure those things by the kingdom of God, by God's standard. You know, someone planting a seed in someone's heart has eternal value. Um, sharing Jesus with someone at the grocery store has eternal value. And you may never see that person again. And you may never see the fruit that is produced in their life because of that one interaction you had or that one encounter that you had. But God sees it and God will reward you for what you've done. So Something that God really just emphasized or, or reiterated to me was, Tessia, stop using human metrics. Stop using likes, follows, post engagements, um, you know, people, how many people approve of what you're doing as a metric, as a standard of measurement and start using obedience as your metric, kingdom things as your metric. You know, when you obey God, you're truly successful regardless of how people respond. That is success. That is valuable. That is, um, you know, victory rather than how people respond to you. The gospel is all about what God has done for us. And we know that the gospel is opposed and we know that um, people are going to reject the gospel. If they rejected Jesus Christ, they're going to reject you. I remember when God first spoke that to me and I thought, God, I don't like being rejected, but no servant is above their master. If they rejected Jesus Christ, they will reject you. He says in John uh, 15 or 16, I believe it is. I think it's at the end of 15 towards 16. He says, um, if they hated me, they, they're also going to hate you. So no servant is above their master. So if they reject Jesus, they're going to reject you. So God spoke to me, stop using human metrics. And when I stop using human metrics, then I can have a new perspective. I can see things the way God sees them rather than the way I see them or the world sees them or the way the devil wants me to see them. If I see things the way God sees them, then I will be filled with life and joy and, and peace because I am trusting that I'm doing what he's called me to do. I am walking in his will. There is no greater joy than to be walking in the will of of God to know that you're doing what he's called you to do. So the next thing is I was listening. It seemed like all week because God is just speaking to me left and right, which I love when God is speaking to me and he's so close and he's so um, faithful in trial, but God just led me in so many different arenas or so many different areas via um, an Instagram post, a book I was reading, a YouTube video I saw, um, even this thing with Bruce Marciano, you know, all these different av outlets or avenues. God was speaking to me about suffering because, you know, discouragement can be a level of suffering. You feel like you're suffering when you're discouraged and hopeless. It does not feel like you're filled with life and joy. So God was speaking to me through all these different avenues about um, 
how to overcome suffering and that he's with me in the trial and all the different uh, things, it, it kind of all tied in with this theme of um, hopelessness and having hope, having faith, having trust in God and being at peace and having joy in that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty and having a new attitude. So the first thing that um, I came across was this YouTube teaching by Elizabeth Elliot, and it was titled Suffering is Not for Nothing. And I said, okay, God, I got to listen to it because, you know, you're speaking to me about suffering and having a different attitude in suffering, having an attitude of hope and faith and praise instead of an attitude of woe is me. Um, I'm hopeless. Nothing will ever work out. So God is refining me and showing me that my attitude needs to change. But I came across this post, this um, YouTube teaching. And it's uh, several teachings long, you know, it's a couple different videos. And she goes through all the different reasons why we suffer and that suffering actually is um, purposeful. Uh, she brought up John 15, you know, I think it's uh, one through five in there. It talks about the gardener and um, he prunes off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. And I thought, oh, Lord, that must be what you're doing. You must be pruning something out of my life um, that you don't want there because you know that you want me to be steadfast and hopeful. Um, some, so I was listening to this teaching and she was talking about all the different reasons why there's, um, why we suffer. And one of them is for the body of Christ. We suffer for the benefit of others. So she shared this story about, and I'll link these below. I'll link them in the, in the description below, but she shared this story about how, someone in um, her, a translator died. So this person who she was translating this language, this native language, and there was only one person who knew Spanish and this language. I don't know the name of the language. She was in Ecuador, I believe, um, working with the, the Indians there. <clears throat> and so they, uh, this guy died. After a year of work, he was shot. Um, and she thought, why? Like, God, why did you let this happen? Why, why did, um, why did you let all my work kind of go down, down the, the tubes or down the drain? Because there's no, um, there's no one else who can help. And so she wrote this book called These Strange Ashes. And this woman years later read that book and, uh, she got healing from it and, uh, freed, you know, freedom from different things in her life from it. And so that very woman who read the book said to her, you know, did you ever figure out why God let it happen? Did you, did God ever tell you why he let this guy die? And she said, I found out, um, when you told me that my book, uh, helped bring your healing. That's why God let it happen to, to help you, to, to free you. And I thought how profound, like we don't think our suffering really matters, um, to other people, but if God can teach us something through it and we share that with someone else and it touches them and it helps free them and deliver them, then that suffering has a purpose. Something else that um, God just showed me was through an Instagram post. Someone was, I don't know who this person is, I didn't even save the video, but someone shared that um, Romans 8 28 says, God will work all things together. And we know that in all things, God will work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this person said that we define good as comfortable, but that's not what God defines it as. Because in the very next verse, in Romans 8, 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So God intends to conform us to be like Christ. And that requires suffering. That requires being uncomfortable. That requires um, pain and stretching and difficulty and trial and persevering through trial and, you know, moving through um, adversity. To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ will require suffering. And that is God's purpose. It is his ultimate good to conform us to his image. And so I saw this, this short little Instagram uh, reel and I thought, God, 
That's what you're doing in me right now. Whatever roots of hopelessness are there, whatever roots of um, despair are there, whatever roots of mistrust, because ultimately at the, at the root of hopelessness is doubt or unbelief. Because I'm not really trusting God. I'm not really adhering to him and believing that what he said is true. I'm now believing what the devil says is true or what circumstances say are true instead of putting my hope and my trust in God and saying, no, God has good plans for me. I know that what he has spoken to me, what God has promised, he is able to fulfill. That's not what I'm saying when I feel hopeless or in despair. So God is showing me that... Um, he, he is pruning off branches of hopelessness. He is pruning off branches of unbelief or mistrust or doubt and um, really stretching my faith and, and testing my, my hope and my trust in him. So um, suffering is good. As crazy as that sounds, suffering is good and it's God's tool to bring about sanctification and holiness in our lives. It's God's tool to make us conform to the image of Christ. The other thing um, that kind of God was speaking as I was walking and listening to this teaching on suffering and um, Elizabeth Elliot was talking about us, um, you know, being made holy and sanctified through suffering and suffering having all these purposes. Um, I thought back to a time when I prayed a prayer um, almost, let's see, six years ago now, almost six years ago now. I wasn't married yet, um, hadn't, you know, I was fairly new in my walk with Christ, but I prayed, God, I want to be a prisoner of hope. I don't ever want to get so hopeless in a situation, so um, discouraged by things not working out how I want them to work out that I lose hope in you. I want to be a prisoner of hope. And I was thinking of Acts. I believe it's chapter five, but it may not be. Um... It's where Paul and Silas are in prison and they sing. I don't think that's Acts chapter 5. So it's in Acts though. And they are singing in the prison. And as they sing, you know, the the chains, there's an earthquake and everything. Uh, the doors open, the chains fall off of them. And the prison guard freaks out because he thinks that, um, you know, everybody has escaped and he wants to kill himself. And then Paul and Silas actually lead him to Christ and say, we're all here. Uh, but I remember thinking, I want to praise in the prison and sing in the suffering. I never want to be that person who is so hopeless and so in despair that um, I, I lose my hope and my trust in God. And so God reminded me of that as I was walking. He said, Tessia, I am answering that prayer of yours. And I thought, what, you know, what a unique way to do it. Um, you, you know, sometimes we pray these prayers and we don't think God remembers them or he hears them because we forget about them. But God remembers them and he wants to answer our prayers even when that answer to our prayers comes in adversity. Um, Elizabeth Elliot even told a story. Uh, I think it was a, a joke or a parody or a little, you know, parable, whatever. But she said in it that a woman goes to a pastor and she says, pastor, please pray that I have patience. I need patience. And he said, okay, I'll pray for you. And he lays his hand on her and he said, Lord, please send this woman so many trials and so much affliction and so much adversity. And she said, wait, 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 that's not what I prayed for. And, or, you know, that's not what I want and what I asked for. And he said, um, but that's how you learn patience through trial, through adversity, through affliction. And so she told that story, um, but I also remembered that God was telling me, you know, I remember when you prayed that you wanted to be a prisoner of hope. And in order for me to become a prisoner of hope, I am going to have to be put in trying situations that feel hopeless to me. And truthfully, um, what I'm going through isn't that hopeless or that hard. It just seems to feel that way to me. I seem to, to have the experience of hopelessness. And so God is showing me, I'm going to test you. I'm going to try you. I'm going to let you walk through difficulty in order to, to trust me, to cling to me, to rely on me, to believe my word over the report of the world, the report of the devil, believe the report of the Lord. God has asked me, do you believe that I have plans for your life? Do you believe I have plans for your ministry? And I have to choose to say, yes, I trust you or God I don't see the results yet I don't see the outcome yet so so I I'm 
not going to trust you. You know, often we can do that with different things that we're going through. We can say, God, I don't see the outcome. I don't see the solution. I don't see how you're going to make it happen. And the Israelites could have said that, and I'm sure they did, um, when they were standing in front of the Red Sea. God, I don't see how you're going to deliver us. I don't see how you're going to set us free. But then Moses parts the Red Sea, and God does something totally unexpected, totally that they, they didn't um, see coming, and he brought about their deliverance. So God is asking us in the little daily trials that we go through or seemingly big trials, you know, they don't feel little to us when we're living inside of it. When we're living inside of our lives, they feel really big to us. So in your loneliness, in your um, trouble with a, a child who's re in rebellion against God, in your um, doubt and unbelief about a job or your future or um, whatever it is, Trust that even though you don't see the outcome yet, even though you don't see the, the freedom or the result yet, that God is working, that God has plans for you, that God is going to move because he is a mighty God. He is an awesome God and he has good plans for you, plans to give you a hope and a future, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So are you going to cling to him in the middle of the battle, in the middle of the trial, or are you going to give up? You know, that's kind of what God is challenging me with. Are you going to cling to me throughout the whole thing and let me bring you to the other side? Or are you just going to give up in the middle? Because if you're going to give up, then you haven't persevered. And even James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because then you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance. Um, oh, let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So welcome the test, welcome the trial as something that is there to refine you, something that is there to help you, something that is there to, to work good in your life. And that's what God's showing me. I need an attitude adjustment. I need to view these, these trials and these temptations as something that's good not something that's bad. I need to view it as God, an opportunity for God to reveal his glory in my life, an opportunity for God to manifest, an opportunity for, for me to be transformed into the image of his son, into the image of Jesus Christ, and for God's glory to be revealed in my life. That is how trials and adversity should be viewed. And yet so often we view them as, why is this happening to me? Woe is me. My life is so hard. So God is... um. God is showing me that my life isn't really that hard and that I'm just believing lies and I need to believe the truth. Another uh, avenue that God spoke to me through about having a new attitude and being a prisoner of hope um, and changing and adjusting is David and I were reading this um, book, this like a historical, not historical fiction, what do you call it? Like, I mean, I guess historical fiction written in Jesus times, kind of about the people who touched Jesus life in the Bible, the different people who, you know, he healed and all of that. Um, but it's written like a novel. So we were reading that and actually Mary, Mary's in it. Um, they're telling the story of Mary and they take, um, what's it called? Creative license. Uh, they share about Mary's life before Jesus was born. And it's just this brief story about how she was going to get married to Joseph, as we all know. Um, but she has a dairy cow as part of her dowry that she's going to give him. And her dairy cow was supposed to give birth to a calf and her, the calf was still born. So then the, the calf died. And um, the uh, the dairy cow gets an infection. I don't know much about cows and milking, but um, basically one of her teats is very like firm and I guess um like all the milk is rotten and she could like become unable to produce milk so that would make a dairy cow very invaluable to someone in ancient times who relied on dairy as um, a source of income or livelihood so as she is trying to help her cow she is praising the lord she said thank you lord for giving me strong hands who can massage um this out praise thank you lord for she's saying praise adonai but thank you you know praise god for um making my cow rose uh so patient and trusting of me and so she's praising god in the midst of this trial and god told me every everything in life is an opportunity to praise me an opportunity to give me glory an opportunity to um to worship me and to trust me and 
I was just really convicting because I thought if I was in that situation, I would not be praising God. When things go wrong, my initial reaction is not to say, praise God. Thank you, Lord. I am so glad that you're going to help me through this trial. And God was showing me that he wants to change that in me. He wants to refine that in me. My first reaction is usually, why did this happen? Who's, whose fault is this? Where's, where is this? Where's the blame? Where, where is um, the, the source? Why, why is this happening? What is wrong? Um, you know, instead of God, thank you for what you're doing in my life. I trust you anyways in the midst of adversity. And I would say that's what um, God wants to do in us. He wants us to, to face adversity. You know, I heard a translation of that verse, James, you know, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, as um, welcome adversity and trials as your friends who are going to, to help you, who are going to perfect you in Christ. Welcome them as your friends. Don't reject them. Welcome trials. Welcome adversity as your friends because they are there to to conform you to the image of Christ. They're there to work good in your life. God has allowed the trial and the adversity to come to you. He's allowed it to happen. Let it work what God wants to work in your life. Let God use it and work it for the good. Don't push it away. So if you're struggling with anything, with anxiety, with fear, with depression, with doubt, with faithlessness, Whatever you're struggling with, take it to God and say, God, it can't be your will that I live hopeless and fearful and doubting. God, what are you trying to refine in me? What are you trying to show me? Because when trial comes and we get squeezed, what comes out of us is um, what's in us. And so when, when God allows us to be squeezed, it's kind of like a revealing of what's in our hearts. And then when we know what's in our hearts, if it's not supposed to be there, we want God to remove it from our lives so that the next time we get squeezed, pure oil can come out. Pure Holy Spirit can come out. Pure goodness can come out. We want to be refined. We want to be sanctified. We want all the impurities to come out of us. So will you let God purify you, refine you? You know, gold is refined by it being heated up and all the impurities come to the surface and then it gets scraped off the top. Um, I believe oil is, uh, you know, squeezed, squeezed out of the, the olives and um, it's strained. So are you going to let God squeeze you or make things really hot you know in peter it says don't be surprised about the fiery ordeal or the fiery trial that's come upon you as if something strange were happening no this this is going to happen in christ don't be surprised by trial this is going to happen so my encouragement would be whatever it is you're going through give it to the lord and say god i want to trust you wholeheartedly I want to give you total control. I want to surrender everything I have to you. I don't want anything at all um, in me that's not of you. And so as God squeezes you and as the trials come, let God refine you and view it as something good and something that's going to bring about change and transformation rather than something to be filled with anxiety about, fear about, um, anger about. Uh, sadness about all these things God wants to remove from our lives and conform us to the image of his son. So I pray that this video blesses you. I pray that this message speaks to you, that God um, heals you and delivers you through it. Lord, I just thank you for everyone watching this video, God. I pray that you would anoint them, that you would fill them, that you would deliver them from whatever it is that binds them, God. And I pray that you would help them through their current trial that they're walking through. Whatever that is, God, I pray that you would speak to their hearts and their minds and you would reveal truth to them and they would know you better, Lord Jesus. I pray that they would know you better in Jesus' name. There actually um, was something else that God spoke to me. Um, in all of this, you know, struggle that I've had, um, God kind of asked me, when did knowing me more intimately not become enough? So one of the purposes of suffering is to participate in the suffering of Christ Jesus. Romans 8, um, 17 says, now, if we are children of 
then we are also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, to share in Philippians 1.29, it says it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. To share in Christ's suffering is to know him more intimately. And another prayer I prayed once upon a time um, on our honeymoon, actually, I said, God, I want to know you intimately. I want to have intimacy with you and I want to know you intimately. And I remember God spoke to me, you know, that means suffering. And I thought, I still want to know you intimately. To know Christ intimately is to participate in his suffering. So God kind of challenged me and said, when did knowing me not become enough? When did having intimacy with my heart and my mind not become enough for you? When did you start needing all these other things? When did you start needing more fruit in your life, more results in your life? And I thought, you know what, Lord, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that I'm looking at numbers and results and outcomes instead of looking at your face, instead of beholding you, because knowing Jesus Christ is by far the most valuable thing in all all the world and outside of the world. Knowing Jesus Christ is the most valuable thing in all the universe, in um, all the existence of every every creature that has ever existed. Knowing Jesus Christ, knowing the God of heaven and earth is far more valuable, far more important than anything else. And so with that, um, I pray that God just ministers to your heart and mind and you have deeper intimacy with him in the midst of suffering. I pray you all have a blessed and a beautiful week, a week filled with God's beauty, and I'll see you next time. Bye.